I uh, started this morning in the class talking about uh, support, financial support in the churches for officers because um, the lack of officers is, in my opinion, as a gospel preacher and a Christian, um, the biggest problem actually facing us as the church that belongs to Christ. I think it is the single biggest problem that almost every other problem um, that the church faces is downstream from that one. Um, perhaps you would say there's some false doctrines going around and that this is sun, uh, rending uh, the church asunder, and that is true, but that's true in part because there are not sound teachers enforcing sound doctrine by means of their office in all the congregations, and it is true in part because there are not... Um, sound teachers exposing that darkness and preventing it from coming. Uh, so I think that is downstream from the bigger problem, which is the lack of officers, the lack of support for officers. I think support for officers is an important thing because I realize that support is necessary. Uh, nobody should love money but you have to have some. That's just how it is. You have to live, you have to eat, you've got to pay bills, there's no free rent, and you don't want, you know, how does that look when, you know, somebody says they are an officer of the Lord's Church, but they have to get charity? Uh, not great. That doesn't look like the church supports the work that's being done, right? So we don't need that. They have to have something. Um, I remember years ago going to an open source software conference in, in uh, uh, Portland, Oregon. A terrible place <laughs> that I never want to go back to. <laughs> but... Um, I remember one of the fellows there was talking, one of the really well-known and respected fellows was talking and saying, we love open source and we love our dedication to freedom and liberty and to, um, you know, worldwide communication and, and cooperation and contribution to the open source product that we're making. He said, but don't you have bills to pay? <laughs> and he looked around and people are like, what is he doing? What is he saying? You know? And he said, is there, I mean, your project that you're doing, is there any way for it to make money? Um, you have a website, no doubt, where you point people when they need to, you know, when they want to contribute source code. Does, is there any link on there for how to pay you? Do you even have an account set up, PayPal or anything to take money in? How are you going to get supported for this work? It was an interesting thing that he said, because I think, you know, He's right that a lot of people think of open source software as free. Well, it may be free to use and free to distribute, but somebody's doing the work and the work is worth money. Right, so what he was saying, I thought, was very interesting in that context. And I think it's true for us, too. We have to accept the fact that even though we are not about money and we're not trying to make money, the fact is we need some. Everybody does. And that is OK. So what does it say about this, the scripture? That's um, you know, that's how we're getting um, the ideas that we're talking about here. And I think that support is a big, big problem. Uh, you know, young men who are trying to preach the gospel uh, cannot find a way to do so without getting a job <laughs> and working a job and preaching at the same time. As a rule, they cannot do that. Sometimes the opposite is true, and perhaps a, a large uh, or wealthy congregation will send a man, a young man, and he will have full support. But he gets the wrong idea that 
he reports to them. And they think that they're supporting the work in the local place, not the man who is doing the teaching, which would be biblical. So it's getting very confused and very messed up. And it's a difficult thing and a difficult problem. And I think that the Bible gives us the things that we need to make it not difficult and not complicated. It's fairly straightforward, actually. <coughs> but we have to make it so. We as the congregations, as the members, we have to make it so with our work, with our attendance, with our contribution, personally. If it doesn't have that level of importance with me, then why should anybody else think it's important? And why should I think that it will succeed? You know that government programs never get canceled or disbanded. They get defunded, right? Nobody says, you guys, we don't need you anymore. Your jobs end at the end of the fiscal year. That never happens. You're always free to continue working, but we're not going to pay for it anymore. And that usually works itself out. <laughs> there was an argument at Yale about whether the professors were employees of the university or not um, and you know they were saying they're they're not employees they're not subject you know because they have tenure and they have that freedom of speech that protection etc cetera, etc cetera. and it went on for some time this argument did but the president solved it by saying it is fine for you to be whatever you would like to be as a professor professing at Yale, but Yale only pays employees. So that solved the problem. Point of that, the point of that being, you can call it what you want, you need to be supported. And, and if you're not being supported, and if you're not being funded, you're being cut. You can't, you can't afford to do it unless you're independently wealthy. You have your own income or source of income. So why do we want it to be that way? Well, we don't. We don't want it to be that way. Um, there's no advantage to us when things are being done that way. If, if you think, oof, over to Hebrews 13, with me. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. It is of no advantage to us when people have to do this by their own sweat and blood, by their own sweat equity. That's not helpful. It's not for our good or for our benefit that it's like that. That is harmful to the churches. So I'm saying this is the this is the biggest problem. You gotta have evangelists, right? Ephesians 4 tells you that you had apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The apostles are the Bible, so are the prophets now. They're they're over. They ceased, 1 Corinthians 13. But we still have the Bible, and we still need that. But we still have evangelists and pastors and teachers. And they equip the saints for the work of service. If you don't have evangelists and pastors and teachers, then you don't have the equipment that you need. 
And if you look at the rest of Ephesians 4, you see that that leads to the unity of the faith, the maturity of the stature of the fullness of the manhood of Christ, the knowledge of Christ, and the result being that we are no longer children tossed to and fro by every wave of doctrine. If you would like to see those outcomes, and I think you do, unity of the faith, Ephesians 4.13, mature manhood, 4.13, 4.14, no longer children tossed to and fro. I think you want to see those outputs, but you can't get them if you don't have the inputs. You're not going to get unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, maturity, if you do not have evangelists and pastors and teachers. Because that's where it comes from. So we said before, we have hard questions. They're not that hard, but they are. First is, what did the New Testament churches spend money on? And you can see the kinds of things that we talked about in the class, and we can look at that, and I can share it with you, whatever you like. But basically, it comes down to, very quickly, um, support of needy saints among the congregation and uh, afar. If there, there was a famine in Judah, they sent money to that. Support of gospel preachers as was commanded in 1 Corinthians 9, and as was indicated in Philippians 4 and 3 John, where they sent men to preach the gospel, support of elders, 1 Timothy 5, which says they are laboring, and you do not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So they are working. They are doing an office. They are doing a job, and they should be compensated for that job. In fact, in 1 Timothy 5, it says that those who labor in both being elders and also preaching the gospel are worthy of both salaries. Double honor means double pay, both salaries, the salary of the evangelist and the salary of the elder. I don't know anybody who's asking for that, but it's telling us that this is worth supporting. That's the whole point. This is the thing that should be important. Because we ask, you know, what did they support? What did they spend money on in the New Testament? But the, you know, the second question that follows up with that is what does the church you attend spend money on? If we compare how they spend it in the New Testament, how does that compare to how you spend it in life today. And I remember well a conversation with an elder uh, some of you know personally <laughs> uh, who is no longer an elder, thankfully. But I spoke with him um, by phone when I was looking for support and he said to me we would have a lot more if we did not have to pay so many preachers. Preachers are expensive. That's what he said. There'd be a lot more money here if we didn't have to pay preachers. They're very expensive. Which is an interesting thing. If you think about it, in the New Testament, they helped local saints, and that was ad hoc, as the need might arise. They did take widows on to, uh, to be enrolled, 1 Timothy 5, meaning that they are on regular care and support. So that is a, you know, a regular expense, something that's being spent to provide support for them. Of course, in the case of the widow, that's one person, not a family. The evangelist may have a family, and that's going to be more. The elder certainly has a family. That's going to be more. But whatever. Does the scripture tell us something about the number or the percentage 
of the expenses that the church expended? No, it doesn't. It's an unusual way of looking at things, I think. But what is the number one largest expense in the local congregation? And why is that the number one most important thing? Should it be the number one most important thing? <coughs> is it really? And why do it that way? If it's not the most important thing, if it's not a commanded thing, then why should it be the biggest thing? Just at a high level, we're asking, without being specific at all, <laughs> does that make sense? That of the total amount the church treasury contains, which is the Lord's money, not ours, the largest part of it goes to something that is not actually commanded? Does that make sense? I don't think it does. I don't see any way you can argue that that's what we should be doing, especially if it means that you are not doing the other things that are commanded. That makes no sense. Except to Satan, who loves it. He loves for us to spend that money on something other than the work of God directly. It is very convincing if it can look like it's the work of God or tangential, important to the work of God. That's very convincing. It's a good way to get us to spend it there instead of what he commanded. What gets paid no matter what? This is just about priority. If every, you know, if a month comes where you, you know, the thing, the commitments that the church has made to its widows, to the needy, to evangelist, elders, whatever, and they can't cover everything. They can't pay all of those. What should they not pay? Right? What gets cut and what gets paid? When the church cannot afford to do everything anymore, what do you stop doing? Should it be things that are commanded in the word of God for us to do? Or should it be things that are not commanded, though they may be allowed and they may be useful? Just at a high level, it seems like that's fairly obvious. Of course, you have to fulfill the commandments first. And then, when these things have been met, you can see if there's anything left over to do optional things. That seems fairly clear without getting into any specifics. We should know that this is what we're trying to do. And you may or may not know, I don't know what your experiences in the churches are, but as a rule in the churches, the first thing that gets cut is gospel preachers. That's just how it gets done. As a rule, when the church starts running out of money, they pull in their support. They call and tell brother so-and-so who is doing the work in Africa or Oregon or whatever, we can't afford to support you anymore. Sometimes. Sometimes they don't call. They just stop sending it, and they give no reason or explanation. And he'll call to see, why is that happening? What happened to my support? And if he was counting on it, poor sucker. My advice to all of them is, do not count on it. Consider it bonus. It may disappear in any month. Which is sad, but that is true. That's what I advise any preacher who is starting up. Do not count on it. It can be yanked any month with no notice and no explanation. Because that's what you see happening in the churches. That's how they handle things. As a rule, that's what happens. They pull in the outside support. What happens then? Okay, we've pulled in all the outside support. We still can't afford to pay everything. Now what do we cut? 
right? And that's what happens. Then the thing that gets cut is the evangelist or the elders, if they're paying them. Most places don't pay the elders at all. But if so, that's what they do next. Cut the evangelist. Uh, meanwhile, a lot of times, the church will continue to support other things. They'll continue, for example, to own property and to pay for it, which is allowed. It's nice. But if it is preventing you from doing the things that are commanded, you should stop doing that. Or whatever it might be. You need songbooks, you need whatever. I don't know what you have to pay for. It depends on what country and what city you're in. Whatever. There are other things that can be done or that can be very expensive. Songbooks, electricity, protection, whatever. Some places you do. You need armed guards. <laughs> whatever those things are, they are expensive and they are useful, but they're optional. You should do the spiritual work first. It is of no benefit to the congregations, the churches as a whole, for their elders and their evangelists to be afraid that the money will be yanked with no notice and for no reason. That is not advantageous to us. That breeds evangelists who are willing to compromise doctrinally so that they do not upset the donors. That's where error comes from. That's why 2 Timothy 4 says they will heap up teachers for themselves according to their own desires. They heap them up by supporting those men and not the others. Okay, that's how it works. And yes, you end up with fellows who are preaching whatever people are willing to support and not saying things that people don't like you to say. They should be reporting to the Lord, and they should be true to his word no matter what, without fear or favor of men. But in point of fact, they do have to eat, and that's being dangled over their heads. So yes, I think it is the biggest problem facing the churches. Let us consider what the scriptures tell us about it. In 1 Corinthians 9, it says, Don't you know those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? Those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial alterings, or, uh, offerings. rather. True, when you look at the law of Moses, the people who were appointed to work there, the Levites, were getting their food not from working the field, because they didn't have a field. Not from you know, secular work like every other Israelite was able to do. They were full-time employed in the service of the temple. Therefore, they got their food from the temple. Those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offering. True, when somebody brings a lamb and they sacrifice that lamb, that, that man who is sacrificing the lamb rejoices in his forgiveness and partakes of that lamb with his family but he does so with the Levite who made the sacrifice in the first place. The Levite has to eat too. So does his family. That's how it worked. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. In the same way as telling me that it gives us guidelines for how this can be done reasonably within, you know, fairness, within balance. However it was that it was administered at that time tells us something about how we could do it today very, in a very straightforward and simple way. Did you realize that it said the Lord commanded? Remember, 14th verse said, in the same way that the Levites did it, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. 
This is a commandment. It is not an option. Something that would be nice to do. No, it's commanded. You must do this. Like any other commandment in Scripture, it has to be fulfilled. That's God's will. In Leviticus 7, when you look back at how he instituted the Levites, in verses 30 down to 36 is really the whole, the whole thing, the whole uh, picture of what they did. And I think that is worth looking at. I'm trying to get to Leviticus now. Leviticus chapter 7, 30 down to 36. Yeah, whoever offers to the Lord, his own hands will bring the Lord's food offerings. He will bring the fat with the breast so that the breast may be waved as a wave offering before the Lord which means the breast is not destroyed. That's what it means. It's waved in the sense that it's held up to God in, in the air. It's not actually destroyed or consumed by fire in the offering. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons. And the right thigh you shall give to the priest as a contribution from the sacrifice of your peace offerings. Peace offerings, that is. Whoever among the sons of Aaron offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion. The breast that is waved, the thigh that is contributed, I have taken from the people of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron the priest and his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel. The Lord said, I have taken from the people out of their sacrifices. It was not Moses and Aaron who came up with this great idea for how they could be fed at public expense. It was the Lord who said, this is how it will be. They have to sacrifice to me to have peace with me. But a portion of that peace sacrifice for the Lord goes into the mouths of the Levites because they got to eat too. This is the portion of Aaron, verse 35, and of his sons from the Lord's food offerings. From the day they were presented to serve as priests of the Lord, the Lord commanded this to be given them by the people of Israel from the day that he anointed them. It is a perpetual due throughout their generations. And by the way, the 37th verse, this is then, in conclusion, the law of the bird offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the ordination offering, and the peace offering that we just read about, which the Lord commanded Moses on Mount Sinai on the day he commanded the people of Israel to bring their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. The peace offering is just one. There are burnt, grain, sin, guilt, and ordination offerings in addition to the peace offerings. But he said this is a commandment and there's no ambiguity about it in Leviticus, and there's no ambiguity about it in 1 Corinthians. In the same way, the Lord commanded that they who proclaim the gospel get a living by that gospel, and in Leviticus, the Lord commanded it to be given by the people. It was always this way, that somebody had to have it as their primary focus their job, if you will, in, in the work of God to be working on these spiritual matters. The Levites are to offer sacrifices, but they're also supposed to teach and to judge and settle matters. That's work. And they don't have fields as inheritance. Their inheritance is the tenth that the people give, if they give it.
Right? Numbers 18, 20 to 24 is where he talked about the tenth or the tithe. And I don't know, you know, I don't know where the word tithe comes from or why they say tithe. I have no idea. It's just a fraction, one over ten. One tenth. What does that word mean? Tithe. Tithe means one tenth. Oh, got it. Yeah, that's why I, I don't know where they got it from or whatever, but it's just one tenth. Ten percent. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Good question. Thank you. Numbers 18, 20. The Lord told Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land. Neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. To the Levites I have given every tenth in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and among the people of Israel they shall have no inheritance." the tenth of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. That is why I have said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. Right, if you're thinking that this is a vow of poverty, it is not. He said, the reason they do not have secular work and secular employment is because they are to be dedicated to this temple service, and that is why the rest of the tribes give a tenth. There are 12 tribes. The Levites have to give a tenth of their income too. That leaves 10 who give a tenth, which makes one salary, one whole. That's how it works. Which is telling you us that when we read in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, in the same way the Lord commanded, it is a direct reference to Leviticus on this matter. The Lord commanded that it be given them. You know, when you compare the contribution in 1 Corinthians 16, 1, it's also a command. The churches of Galatia are directed to give. I don't know why people say, the contribution is a necessary inference. I've heard Christians say that. I do not know why. It's commanded. You must give. But again, the tithe is a tenth. It's just simple math. That's all we're saying. Because there's 12 tribes, and Levi is one of them, and they are not able to contribute because they don't have fields, they don't have that secular work, that leaves 11. If 11 tribes give one-tenth, then the Levite has, if you will, in some sense, control over 110%. Not really, because it's being given to the Lord. But they have control over 110%, and the Levites are required to give 10%. So in the end, 11 tribes have 90% to themselves before all the other offerings, and the Levites have 89%, right? Or maybe 81%, because they're giving a tenth of 100 and 10. Right, a tenth of 100 is 10. That brings them down to 90. A tenth of ten is one. That brings them down to 89. So the 11 tribes have retained 90% of their income, given 10% of their income. The Levite tribe has retained 89% of their income, given 11%. Or, uh, well, they've retained what is the equivalent of 89% of the other tribe's income. Okay. So that there is fairness. There is equality. The Levites do as well as the people do. Not better, not worse. And again, it's only one of the many things that they were commanded to give. We don't say in our hearts that uh, we have these other expenses, we have these other things that are costing us 
and we take that out of the Levites. No, you can't do that. You got to give your tenth for the Levite. And then there are free will offerings. There are other offerings, the peace offerings, the sin yeah. offerings, all the other things that are in the law, meaning that there are things that we do sacrificially in service to God that we choose to do. Maybe you do charity for somebody or you pay for something out of your own pocket instead of getting um, uh, reimbursed from the church treasury for it. That's perfectly acceptable and a good thing and God will pay you back. But you don't take that out of your tenth that is intended to feed the Levites. Those are additional offerings. Uh, let's see. The other thing that should be considered is in 1 Corinthians 9, at verse 9, it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. When he says this, he's saying they're working. The ox that's treading the grain, well, that, why would you muzzle him? Well, because you don't want him to eat any of the grain that he is breaking up for you. So he's doing the work of breaking up all the grain, but you don't want him to eat any. <laughs> An ox, you know, breaks a whole lot more grain than he eats. Just one ox eating is not a big deal compared to the reason why you're using an ox to tread grain. It's a bunch of grain. His point is that's pay. It's compensation for work being done. When you look at 1 Timothy, as we did earlier, and I'll go there again in 1 Timothy 5, when, the, when Paul is laying out the rules that govern elders, he said to them, 17th verse and 18th verse, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Honor means financial support, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain is exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 9 when he was talking about supporting gospel preachers, those who are getting their living from the gospel. But he also brings in, in the 18th verse of 1 Timothy 5, this reference to the laborer deserves his wages. Now, you should not muzzle the ox. That's the law of Moses. But where does the laborer deserves his wages come from? Well, it comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Well, that's an interesting thing in and of itself, that... By the time 1 Timothy is written, you have the Gospel of Luke in hand for him to tell Timothy it is written. But he said he appointed twenty-two or 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them at verse 5, if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. I'm sorry, verse 5, whatever house you enter... First say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it returns to you. And the seventh verse said, remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. When he sent them out to preach the gospel, he told them, you stay there and you eat and drink what that house provides, because the laborer deserves his wages. If there's any 
confusion or question, or if there was any, I hope there isn't any more, that 1 Corinthians 9 is absolutely talking about pay for preachers, pay for elders, the officers of the church. It is commanded. As he says, don't we have the right to eat and drink? Don't we have the right to take along a sister, a wife? They always translate a believing wife. That kind of upsets me because it's actually a reference to Song of Songs. Song of Solomon. A sister, a wife. As do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. Everybody else has a family. They're being supported. Should the evangelists not be able to have a family? And be supported? Is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? He and Barnabas are working. What kind of work? It's Second Thessalonians 3, 8 through 9. With toil and labor we worked night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you. When they were in Thessalonica, they worked secular work, making tents, and spiritual work, preaching the gospel. And we know from our own reading that they were doing this with the support of Philippi. It was Philippians 4, 15 to 16. It was Philippi who entered partnership in giving and receiving even while he was in Thessalonica. Why even Thessalonica? Is it far? Is it bad? No, it's next door. <laughs> it's the next city over. But they wouldn't take it. So Philippi did it. These men were preaching the gospel and getting support from Philippi, yes, but they were also working with their hands, building tents. That's why he said, what he did with toil and labor, we worked night and day. And I can speak to that. I've, I've done this too. I wouldn't say that I'm an apostle or that I paid the price that the apostles paid. No. But I did work secular work from 99 to last year, the end of last year in addition to preaching the gospel the entire time. Uh, that's 23 years of overtime. <laughs> 23 straight years of overtime. And that's why I look so terrible. <laughs> You're like, what happened to this guy? Man, he's all beat up and scraggly, old and whiter, gray, every you know, more gray every time I see him. It's true. I think it's because, yeah, that was maybe a little too much. But, you know. Sometimes that's what you have to do. And I don't say it to accuse the church here. I don't think that's true. I think the church here has done very well. But to teach the truth about this is to say that um, evangelists have not been supported so that they don't have to work in that way. It cannot be uh, good for us when they have to do both things. Let me stop for a minute here and think. These are things that we're saying, you know, what, you know, what is the priority? What should be the priority? What is important to do and to support? Can the members give a tenth of their income? I think so. It's possible. By no means is there any scriptural authority for us to know as a congregation how much money you make um, or how much you will give, you know, that's 
not our business. I understand that, you know, human religions do this. They require their members to give them sometimes tax returns <laughs> to prove what their income was for last year. And then they look at the contributions from that person and see if it measures 10. And if it doesn't, they bill them. I think that's not authorized. It's not up to you to force people to give money. <laughs> the Lord loves a cheerful giver. But that's not authority for you to say, well, I'm not cheerful giving 10%. I, I'm really only cheerful giving $20. <laughs> that's where I can be cheerful. And I think that's where the Lord wants me to stop. Mm, no, no, that's not the reason why he said that. It means you got to shift your own attitude. I would say in some, you know, I guess in some closing thought on this for now. We would say, look, the, uh, the law was a type of what was coming. We are not Jewish. We are not tithing. I see no authority for the practices of modern churches prying into people's personal finances, etc. Nope. None of that is scriptural. Do not think for a moment that I'm asking for such things. What I'm saying to you, brethren, is if we know from Hebrews that the law is good, but we know that that commandment or that uh, covenant was inferior, the sacrifices of that covenant cannot forgive sins. The blood of that covenant cannot wash away sins. The promises of that covenant were only death. If you look at what we have in Christ Jesus, a better mediator, a better covenant, a better sacrifice, a better hope, a better promise. How will we look at that and say everything about it is better, including the price? Now we have to sacrifice less for him. God will be happy if we give less than they gave to a covenant that is better, a sacrifice that is better. Not blood of bulls and goats, but his son, Jesus Christ. How will you think that this better covenant, these better promises, your eternal forgiveness, are worth less than 10%? I don't know how. That's not a thing that... I think you can support from the scriptures. I, I don't see it. How can it be a better covenant, better promises, better sacrifice? Everything about it is better. And in the same way as they did, we are commanded to do. And somehow we support it less. We give it less. We treat it as less important in our lives. We pay less for it. We give less time to it. I don't see it. That's not scriptural. I can't see it. I don't know what anybody gives. Don't, don't get any bad ideas here. <laughs> I'm not looking for a raise. I suspect that if we did a 10%, they would be a lot smaller than what I'm, I'm seeing right now, and if, truthfully, which would be perfectly scriptural and I would absolutely accept because we've just made the case for that. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what people give. I don't want to know what you give. But I'm saying to you, friend, think about it. If they gave like that, under those circumstances, how much should you give? What is it worth? Does it matter what's being done here? Does it matter what's being taught here? Do we really need to see people be saved? Do people be taught? The word be spread? How will it spread? Which, again, I say not to this congregation or any congregation in particular. I'm saying this is the doctrine of God. 
Nonetheless, if the shoe fits, wear it. Put it on. Look at yourself. Are you giving as you should give? Not because I'm looking for more money or a raise or whatever, but because the Lord commands it, and the Lord deserves it. And the work is important, and it's worthy of support. I mean, most of us are in, you know, 25% tax bracket. That's <laughs> two and a half times a tenth. <laughs> Some are in a much higher one than that. Right? If they are worthy of support, and they are, I understand they don't always do what we want with the taxes, okay? and Get out there and vote, yes. But nonetheless, we do need a government. We do need roads. We do need a military. Yes, that's worthy of support. If that one, and, and they have a right to exercise that authority over us, does not the Lord so much more? That's all we're saying. You've got to look at yourself, because I'm not going to do it. I, I'm not interested in anybody's personal finances, okay? <laughs> I don't know what people give. I never have. Um, you know, I'm not looking for any of that. Not my business. Do not care, other than to say, you better be right. It's not my business, but what you're giving to God, you better be right because God is looking at it and he has expectations and he knows what you're saying, whether it's important or it's not important, whether it's the most important or second or third or fourth. So whatever it is you're doing, it better be right for God and for your sake. That's all. We all have to make that, you know, assessment for ourselves. But do so, and think about the importance of the work. If you don't support it, how will it grow? If you don't support it, how will it go forward? How will the word be spread? Well, God will find a way. Yeah, he will. He will. But that won't go well for you. He doesn't need our money, I understand. But somebody needs money. He'll find a way, yes. But if it's not through me, then I'm not blessed. And if I call myself a child of God and it's not through me, I'm worse than not blessed. I'm cursed. So, a lot of things to think through. That's all. Thank you for your kind attention. I think it is the most important thing that is facing the churches. If the evangelists had the support they needed, they wouldn't be compromised nearly as badly as they are. They wouldn't be afraid nearly as much as they are. Places could have what they need in terms of teaching. If the, if the elders could be compensated, there could be people who are paying attention, very close attention to what you are doing. And if you're not able to assemble or something is wrong, they can have a study with you the next day. If you're sick, they can come and visit you and pray over you, James 5. And they should. That's one of their duties. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I think it'd be wonderful. What if the elders of the church came while you were sick and they laid hands on you? How much better you would feel? Not for miraculous healing, but just human touch, <laughs> concern, care, and prayer on your behalf. That's James 5. The elders do this. But they can't do it if they're stuck at work. There's so many things that are like it that we need, whether we realize it or not. I think leaving secular work has caused me to realize how many needs were being unfulfilled. I knew that I was giving the work short shrift very often, and it was never as good as I wanted it to be. It was never as complete as I wanted it to be. I already knew that for 23 years. What I did not know is how badly it was short, how little was actually being accomplished and done. We were really being hurt by that. We're really suffering from that. And I realize that's got to be true for elders too. It has to. It's not good for the church. We need it. We need to be, be able to do this. Let's put our hands to the plow and not look back. That's all. All right. Today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian, a child of God. If you want to be forgiven in the greatest covenant that there is by the Son of God, by the blood of his Son, you can do so if you change your heart to serve God and put him first a permanent change, repentance, and obey him in baptism for forgiveness of sins. You'll become a Christian. 
You'll be his servant from then on to live faithfully. Yes, as a promise. But we know, too, that we falter from time to time. Well, the Lord knows that and has a way for us to be forgiven if we will repent again. If you as a Christian have not lived right, repent. Let us pray for you that you might be restored. The prayers of the saints are indeed very effective. If you need our prayers to uh, to, to help you in the spirit, if you need to be baptized, please let it be known at this time, which we have set aside by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.